Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam Lacey, and I'm the co-chair of the Young Icebreakers. Um, our, well, the other co-chair is also here in the audience today, Edward Hobbit Roy, Roy Pierce. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to the first Young Icebreaker event of 2015. Uh, but before I say any more about the, um, tonight's event, I'd also like to take this opportunity to talk about a few of our upcoming events. So as many of you will be aware, uh, we have the uh, Chinese New Year dinner uh, on the 9th of February. It may not be a massive surprise to you all, but uh, the event sold out a long time ago. I just hope this will act as a kind of strong signal to uh, get in there early the next year. Um, we also have, um, very kindly, that the new uh, commercial minister from the embassy um, coming to talk to us on the 19th of March. Um, finally, we have um, the Young Icebreakers dinner uh, in May, and uh, the ambassador will be um, our main speaker for the event. Again, sort of, uh, you know, a lot of the information about these events will, will follow into the course. Um, I would like once again to extend our gratitude to Linklaters uh, for hosting today's event. Um, their support is obviously much appreciated. I would also like to say that it is obviously a great honour for us to have uh, the Global Managing Director of McKinsey, Dominic Barton, talk to us today on uh, China and the global opportunity. It is also um, a great pleasure and on open uses interchangeably, uh, to have Peter Nolan speak to us, or, well, in this case, chair the Q&A. So um, if you could all welcome both of them uh, with Thank a you. round of applause. Um, but finally, before the main event, I'd just like to introduce uh, Nicola from Linklaters, who will say a few words. Thank you. Well, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And as Adam said, thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'm Nicola Mayo. I'm a partner here at Linklaters. And on behalf of Linklaters, we're delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture. As you know, the 48 Group Club performs a pivotal, uh, a pivotal role in helping businesses to understand China. And it's an honor for Linklaters to continue to support the 48 Group Club and its efforts in building relationships between China and the UK. And like the 48 Group Club, at Linklaters, we're keenly interested in China's development, its emergence on the world stage, and the opportunities that it creates for our many clients. And we're fortunate not to have, to have had the opportunity of supporting many companies around the world as they invest in China. But also, we have relationships with many Chinese corporates that are growing their businesses globally. I've had the pleasure and uh, the delight, to be fair, of um, seeing this firsthand, having spent uh, the last four years working in our Shanghai office. And for me, it was a fascinating experience watching our international clients tackle the ever-changing China, a country that's experiencing huge growth, <coughs> dramatic economic and social development and changes, but also one that's grappling with its own challenges, eliminating corruption, and trying to ensure economic stability by accelerating reforms. And in my time in Shanghai, we've seen a huge number of proposed reforms from um, the start of the RMB internationalization, the launch of the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, more recently, the establishment of the Hong Kong Shanghai Connect, and including last week's fundamental, fingers crossed, um, proposed reforms to China's foreign investment regime. But in reality, there is still a long way to go. Um, similarly, though, it's been very rewarding and a real um, a sort of eye-opener in some ways, working for our PRC clients and helping them as they venture outside China, um, well beyond Asia. And that, for me, is a real true reflection of China's growing influence and global power. And it's not just um, the state-owned enterprises that we've seen venturing outside of China, but increasingly more and more private entities 
And the thing that really sort of stays with me from that is that we're working in some cases for um, these these private entities, which are unheard of, frankly, on the international stage. But in comparison to companies here in the UK, many of these unheard of entities are often larger than many of our FTSE 100 companies. It's, it's truly staggering. And now I'm here back in London, um, I'm helping co-lead the China desk that we've established here. It's one of several desks that we have around the world where we focus on supporting our Chinese clients in their business endeavors outside China. And we certainly consider ourselves hugely privileged to have had some, of, some involvement in some of these really exciting developments. Well, on to this evening's proceedings. We are very honoured to have Professor Peter Nolan to here to chair the discussion this evening with Dominic Barton. Peter, one of the most preeminent scholars in understanding historical and cultural current developments in China, and he's previously been described as knowing more about Chinese companies and their international competition than anyone else on earth, including on China. So, Peter, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to you, please. Have I got that? Okay. Right, uh, right it's, it's an, an, a tremendous pleasure uh, to introduce, be asked to introduce uh, Dominic and, and to chair the meeting, even though... Paradoxically, I'm not chairing it because I'm standing up as opposed to sitting. But it's a very strange, uh, a very, very great pleasure to introduce I, I actually scratched my head. I don't know how to introduce him. We've known each other for many years. So I'm going to play very safe, and I'm going to read the introduction as a paragraph from a book called A History of the Firm, the firm being McKinsey, which everybody knows about. And in this, uh, it has the following uh, sentences uh, about, about Dominic. Uh, this was uh, in uh, 2003, and this was uh, when uh, Ian Davis, uh, who was then the managing director of McKinsey, McKinsey restructured McKinsey and introduced three new regional directors, of which Dominic was one. For Asia, uh, the book tells us uh, the history of this firm, a very, very interesting book. He appointed Dominic Barton, who had been the young pretender in the balloting for managing director. Now, at the age of 40 in 2003, he would succeed the old hand John Stuckey. <laughs> sorry about that, Dominic. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it was 30. Sorry, 30. Yeah. 30. 30. Sorry about that. 30. 30. <laughs> he would succeed the old hand John Stuckey in overseeing McKinsey's office in that vast region, so very, 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 and I know a very significant period in, in, in Dominic's life. Uh, Barton was one of the many younger people, uh, which says a lot about the culture of McKinsey, that Ian Davis, as then MD, managing global managing director, would call upon to take leadership roles. A Canadian by birth, a Rhodes Scholar with postgraduate training in economics at Oxford, PPE actually, um, he came to the firm first in 1986, having never heard of it before being asked to apply out of the blue. He came, quotes, as a junior associate, a non-traditional, non-MBA hire, in the first wave of what would become more common practice in the 21st century. He went on to have a highly successful career in Canada, then in Korea, where he became office manager. When he took on the Asia role, he was relatively young, quotes, entrepreneurial, but unproven for a senior position. Um, then the final comment about this appointment was a sentence which reads, Barton may have been the biggest personnel risk that Davis ever took. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. But obviously it was a risk that was a very calculated risk that paid off handsomely, uh, and Dominic then himself moved into the position occupied formerly by, by Ian uh, in 2009 and has been um, with McKinsey ever since. I I'm not going to give a speech, um, just simply to say that I, I have a broad idea of the kinds of issues that, that Dominic will touch upon uh, based upon his deep experience and knowledge in Asia and McKinsey's deep in, in, uh, interest in the region. Uh, some of the questions that interest me particularly, uh, and, and I know that he will touch upon, are questions about China's transition from being a low and middle income country to a high income country, which still has a long, long way to run. And I know Dominic's presentation will bear upon this still very, very big question for China. Uh, he also will touch upon the question of Chinese national champion companies are going out. And um, there are many issues uh, that, that surround that very complicated question, and I know that he will touch upon those as well. And also he looks at the other issue, which is the role that global companies will play going into China, particularly their role uh, in creating an energy efficient green China. What role will companies from the West play in that process compared to indigenous Chinese companies? It's a very, very big question. Um, a question that uh, all this, in a sense, bears upon in, in, a, in a fashion is international relations, the transformation of the whole global political economy in the era, the era ahead of us. And I was very privileged to be asked 
uh, to give uh, two speeches, one in London, one in Beijing, on the Silk Road by land and sea. And um, these are fundamental questions of global strategy and political economy. And again, um, while he doesn't, Dominic uh, may or may not, I'm not quite sure, address the question specifically of the Silk Road by land and sea, it's a colossal transformation of global political economy. And if one goes back and rereads, for example, Brzezinski's key papers and books on this question, one can see just how foundational this is in reshaping the world. And finally, um, a very interesting question for Chinese companies to think about is McKinsey itself um, and the role that Chinese firms might play in globalization in non-financial services uh, and how and to what degree China might build powerful law companies, powerful media and marketing companies and firms uh, like McKinsey's. And what can they learn from the history of your company in, in trying to construct globally competitive firms? So, Enough from me, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Dominic to, to come and talk to us tonight. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. <laughs>Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And I just, not to make it a love-in or whatever, but, but um, <laughs> I, have, I cannot tell you the respect I have for Peter. I think that, uh, that the UK is very, very lucky to have such a distinguished and deep expert. This is a fountain of knowledge. I get the chance to you know, meet with him as often as I can just to tap into his deep and broad network. So I think probably you should be talking here. And I, I almost feel like I'm doing a, you know, a, a PhD submission. I'm going to get attacked at some particular point by the, the expert who will come in. Yeah, I'm he's watching. watching. He's watching. <laughs> um, but what, what, what I, and I know there's some, I see some uh, other deep experts uh, out, out here as well uh, in, in the audience too. Uh, so hopefully you'll contribute as well as we go through it or disagree if you think my views aren't, aren't right. Um, but what I wanted to do for the next uh, half an hour or so is maybe just take you through a bit of a overview as, uh, as we see it from, from our vantage point. Our, our vantage point mainly comes from working with private Chinese companies. That's the bulk of our work in China. It's about 70% of our work is with these private Chinese companies, just like you mentioned at the beginning from the law firm the side. And, and again, some amazing institutions that um, I've, I've learned so much from globally uh, from working with these institutions. We do do work with state-owned enterprises, um, and we do do work, obviously, with multinationals uh, that are there. Uh, and we also do work with, with cities. In fact, when we started in China, the bulk of our work was, was with mayors of cities, and it was actually putting in KPIs, which I was shocked when I first came in in 2003 at how aggressive the performance management was of mayors in China uh, to deliver impact and results. I mean, I was, I was quite frankly shocked. A lot of Western companies uh, could learn a lot from how that, uh, how that was done. So that's kind of the bit of the, the overview. Um, I lived in, Ch in China, I, lived at, I was based out of Shanghai for about six years, um, so I, I drank the Kool-Aid, uh, and I'm, I'm, I have to tell you I'm biased when I come, you're going to hear that. Um, and I, I try and go back as often as I can. I'm now more based in, in London, but, but try as much as I can uh, to go back about eight times a year I, I'm in, uh, in China. So let me jump right into, uh, into this. Um, I want to talk first about some of the forces that are cha shaping we think are shaping China. And then what, what are some of the implications for business? This is going to have more of a, a business focus than, than anything else. I, one of the charts that I'm keen to start with is that when we talk about the future, we, I think, are best to look at actually the past. And this is something that Peter mentioned at the, at the beginning when we think about the Silk Road by land and sea. When we look back, this is an Angus Madison chart, and you look at where the world GDP was really up until about the early 1800s, the bulk of the world's GDP was in this region, China and India. Uh, and so we should remember that. We should remember it because a lot of those trade routes and relationships amongst countries that existed a 1,000 years ago are the ones that are coming back now. And I, I am going to double click, so to speak, on that. I think it's the one line, one belt. I'm not yeah. sure what, how, how the governments termed it exactly, exactly, but this, the Silk Road in particular, which I think is going to have a massive effect on how things work. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to think about that, that history um, because we're going to go back uh, to a lot of that as we move forward. 
we all know about the rapid growth. I'm not going to spend much time on, on this, um, how China has now surpassed the, the uh, uh, Japanese economy and is moving forward. I, by the way, I'm not a big believer that China is going to surpass the U.S. economy by 2030. I think we underestimate the strength and power mm -hmm. of the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. but, but frankly, it doesn't matter. Uh, this isn't a competition. The faster China grows, the better we are. The faster the U.S. grows, the better we are. This is not a, a competition. I just I don't think we should underestimate the strength, the underlying strength of the of the U.S. economy on uh, where it is. But the six forces that I wanted to focus on, which make me feel bullish about the prospects for China, at least over the next 10 to 15 years, <coughs> are the following. The first is urbanization. And in my view, urbanization is like a gravitational force. You, you cannot stop migrant workers from moving from rural areas to cities. And I think that there have been very many attempts to try and stop that. There have been very many crises in place. But you get this movement. I think it's roughly 250,000 people a week moving from rural areas to cities. Uh, Premier Lee in Davos last week talked about last year 18 million people moved from rural areas to cities. Coming from Canada, that's basically half the country I come from in one year moved. And when you think about that and what that does for economic growth, it's very powerful. That's, that's where this emerging middle class is coming from. So I'm talk about urbanization, a very, very powerful force. And let's remember that China is only now 60% urbanized, so there's still a lot of runway to go uh, on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about this middle class because the middle class in China is unlike other middle classes in other parts of the world. It is very dynamic. The, the needs and aspirations and ambitions of this consumer class are changing very, very rapidly at a rate five to six times faster than what we see in a typical Western middle class. You have to be careful about generalizing because, by the way, a middle class in uh, the northern part of China is very different from the middle class that's around the Shanghai. There's a lot of variation, but I'm just saying in general, it's the speed of change of their, of their <clears throat> needs and what they want. That very, has very different business implications if you're running a business in China versus you're running uh, a business uh, in California. Uh, the internet. Uh, the, the internet is just having a dramatic effect on every sector and we think in many ways if you you know a lot of people say let's go to the silicon valley to understand what the future may look like and that's a good thing to do i would also be going to shenzhen and hangzhou these are places where i think some of the biggest innovations are going on in big data big the the biggest innovations in big data in my view are not going on in, in the united states they're going on in china so if you want to learn about that go to china don't you're not going to learn it as much from on the us side the source of global champions that was mentioned, these companies that are rising up, uh, a lot of them are private, um, are, are moving beyond just the domestic market and are moving into the global market. And this is something that P one of the many things Peter does is, is initiate, a, he's initiated a group. I don't know how long it's been going for. 2005. 2005, he started bringing SOEs to Cambridge actually for two weeks, is it? Or how? Two and a half. Two and a half weeks to hear what they can learn from other companies that have gone global because and I'm going to show you some charts about how quickly Chinese companies are globalizing. And they're not just they're not globalizing because of their scale and their cost. They're globalizing because of their innovation and business processes that they have. So we'll talk a bit about that. There is obviously the continued state influence. Uh, my view on this I would just say is that there's quite a lot of uncertainty. I think there's a transition going on. Um, I don't claim to be, I, I wish I could set a, say I've been in China for 30 years to understand what's different now and then. What I can tell you is it just feels very different today than it did uh, six or seven years ago, where you, at least you knew someone who knew something about what was going on. I think now if you talk to people, insiders, honestly about where it is, you often will get a lot of not 100% not sure what's happening here. It's not, I'm again, I'm bullish, but there's a lot of transition, uncertainty, some fear, both domestically and from the, the foreigners. And I think that's going to continue for a while. But my view is you shouldn't be frightened by that. That's part of doing business in a volatile world. You just power, uh, power through it. But we'll talk a little bit about that. And then about the financial environment, where there's a lot of reform going on, but we still have a fairly basic financial system. It's not as well developed as it 
needs to be, we need to deepen the capital markets, we need to get the shadow banking system uh, reduced and moved more into the sunlight, so to speak. But the, but, but the government's very well aware of that, and this is not news to anyone and where it is, but it's a factor in terms of how things work. So those are the six areas I wanted to focus on. These are things that we think are gonna shape how China performs, how it looks, what it's like for those of us that wanna do business in there as, as we go ahead. So on urbanization, some of you have seen this before, so I apologize if you've seen it. It's a picture I took of Shanghai in the Pudong area in 1997. I was living in Korea at the time. We went for a holiday to Shanghai. And as I said, many, I've said this before, many of my colleagues in McKinsey call it Pu Jersey. You know, it's, the, it's Pudong, it's the Pudong, you look it over. And that was 2000, and, oh, sorry, 1997. If you look in 2004, right, you just, you just see a, in seven years a dramatic change. And you look at, you know, 2014. So the speed with which this is being built, you, you, numbers are one thing. I, I think it's better to look at it as pictures in terms of how fast this is going. And this is going on in 150 cities in China today. It's happening. Um, and, and that's why we think I'm now taking pictures in other cities just to see what it's going to look like. Uh, what, what's it going to be like five to seven years from now? And with this migration, these are going to be very significant cities. And that's why I do not believe there's an infrastructure overload. I don't, you know, a lot of people talk about the empty buildings. Yeah, there are some empty buildings. I do not, I'm a believer in the property market in China. It's going to have bubbles. It's going to go up and down in terms of where it goes. You've got to be able to provide housing for a very large number of new population over the next 10 years as if we're 60% urbanized. And then we've got a group of people that are already in some of these cities. And again, the government's laid out an initiative to try and restore or revamp 100 million sort of households within the cities that, that, that exist. A lot, we have a lot of real estate clients we work with. One, I'm not gonna, we don't ever talk about our clients or name them by name, but one of them said, you know, We've been in the golden age. We're not going to go into the bronze age. We're going to go into the silver age. You know, don't think, yes, it's not going to be as robust as it was before, but we're not going back. It's a, it's a, that to me was sort of epitomizes, I think, where, uh, where people see it. Uh, Chinese cities are going to fuel more than a quarter of global growth in GDP up to 2025. The, we, we like to think in McKinsey now about growth in terms of cities, not countries. Yeah. Um, and when you actually look at where the largest, fastest growing cities are gonna be, they are in the uh, emerging markets. And again, China has a vast high proportion of, of those. And there's some big issues as Peter mentioned about how we do this in a sustainable manner. We all know about the pollution um, and, and the challenges with water and so forth is gonna have to be dealt with. Uh, but the fact remains that these cities uh, that are there are going to be where the the growth is going is going to be and we and we actually in a sense I don't just sound arrogant we know where those cities are now they're they're there I'd argue that many Westerners have never heard of 90 percent of these cities but they better if they want to be relevant uh, over time and and where it is um, we already know a bit about the size I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this but the the Chinese cities are you know, are already very, very significant economic uh, centers. We, we actually like to look at China as not a country, but as 22 clusters of cities, uh, because they have very different uh, buying behaviors, attitudes amongst consumers, or even regulations. And so when we think about entering a, the market of China for our clients, these are the multinationals, we don't think you need to be everywhere in China. Pick your clusters. Uh, because each of these clusters themselves is larger than many countries uh, that people operate in. So that I, I'm, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through these, but the cluster notion of cities, I think, is a quite important uh, prospect of how we look at it. So that this urbanization is a, is a gravitational force that we think will continue <coughs> to, to drive growth. Uh, it's driving the size of this middle, the increased size of the middle class. It's driving all the infrastructure the demand for food, the consumer goods, the cars, uh, phones, and all of that stuff, it's just gonna keep uh, pushing forward. The middle class, uh, this we think is why the next 20 to 30 years are gonna be some of the most interesting times in a 300 year history. Um, 
we're going to find, because of urbanization, about 2.2 billion new middle class consumers. This is by 2030. Uh, again, the big majority of that coming from China. And this is going to be the global uh, middle class. And this is, again, where you have disposable income of over $3,600. That's where we, we look at where people can actually start buying refrigerators and scooters and phones and so forth that are there. It's not like our middle class in the UK or, or, or in the US, but it's where people spend uh, and, and move it through. It's very large. By the way, when I'm talking about this, I'd also say that Africa is a place that we also have ignored for too long. Africa is going to be a very significant um, part of the global economy. It's got the youngest absolute population. You're going to see a billion new um, people coming into Africa over the next 30 years. And I think it's interesting that China has, in a sense, been the first to rediscover and believe in where Africa is going. There's lots of challenges with how China is interacting with Africa. I'm not saying it's all going smoothly, but I, but I think there's a sense of that linkage uh, that, that's, um, that's, that's occurring. Um, Urban home ownership is higher in China than it is in the United States and other uh, developed countries, which I think is something else that should be recognized, the importance of housing. And when you have a home or you have a base in which you can, a permanent place to live out of, we think it provides for a more stable middle class. People are able to have a foundation to be able to buy more, invest more, uh, do uh, more in terms of thinking about the future than you would have in a places where you don't have that case. And it, again, we found it surprising, again, that China has such a high standard versus developed countries, let alone when we start to look at India, uh, Indonesia, and, and obviously uh, Africa as we go through it. I think that, that bodes well. That's a, a, a force of uh, security. Um, wages and labor productivity continue to go up. There is a worry about the middle income trap, right? The middle income trap typically is when you see what, you know, can wages keep growing or, and therefore not damage the exports, right? As you go, as you go through it, there's a, a challenge. I'm a believer that, that, that uh, China will come through the middle income gap because of, of the size of the domestic economy. We're not going to rely so much in China on exports because the, the size of the domestic or potential size is so large. What, cons consumption as a percentage of GDP, I believe, is around 40% in China today. In the US, it's about 75, 70 to 75%. One um, analogy or simple way of looking at, again, I like pictures and, and simple things. We do, what, there's a, the, the mayor of Beijing has an advisory board and he wanted us to do some work on how to build the services industry and what's the potential. And so what we did to try and illustrate the gap is I brought in the Manhattan yellow pages, the ones that are actually printed. Obviously, most things are online. And if you get the Manhattan yellow pages printed, they're, they're literally about uh, two feet thick. If you get the Beijing yellow pages that are printed, it's about uh, an inch and a half high. And that's all job. Those are all services, right? And they're weird services. You know, in, in Manhattan, you can... If you have a 1955 Cadillac, there's actually a company that, that is specialized in repairing the fins on 1955 Cadillac. Is that sort of, you know, we're not going to have that in China right now, but I'm just saying the variety and weirdness of services that are provided is very high. And that's where there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And just on that matter, you, you know, ch what, what, what I think, I'm going to come to this in the internet in a second. What, Alibaba has done, and they aren't the only one, there's a 10 cents, others that are, that are playing a role in this, to allow SMEs, the small, medium-sized enterprises, to come into the business world is something like we've never seen before. I think Jack Ma last week claimed, I don't have the data on it, said that they're responsible for creating 14 million jobs through that because it's allowed people to participate in a market system that they otherwise wouldn't have participated in. And, and I think the potential is much, much more significant to that. I go back to the, the phone book. One of the biggest challenges is that it's very complicated to start up a new business in China. And I think I'm excited by some of the reforms that China is now putting in place, which is to actually reduce the number of stamps you have to get to get a new business started. And I, I remember the, the previous mayor uh, in uh, Beijing going into his office once, and he had a sign on his wall. It was in Mandarin, except for the numbers, which I could understand. And it was 36356. And I thought it was some new party 
you know, mantra, some, I don't know what it was, some, probably 1936, five, I was trying to figure this out. And I asked him, he so it simply goes, in Beijing it takes 36 days to start a business from scratch, from nothing. It takes 35 in Shanghai and six in Singapore. And I want everyone coming into my office to see that before they see me. You know, what, maybe, maybe Mayor Bloomberg may have had something like that. I think he could have learned something uh, from that side of it. But this kind of focus on how do we speed up the ability to move things forward. So the, get, dealing with the bureaucracy is going to be an issue. But I, so I'm, I'm, I feel bullish about getting through the middle income trap because of the potential of the domestic economy. But we need to make it easier for Chinese entrepreneurs to get into the system. I think that the internet companies have had a more powerful effect than government policy, with all respect to the uh, government policy players about people coming into the system. But there's more to, more to come. Um, we, we think it's very important, as I said, to look at things like cities. We have a database of about 4,000 cities in the world. And so if you are, you know, if you're selling diapers or you're selling soft drinks, you can actually literally go and look through the system and say, where, where are the top cities in the world to sell your particular products? We took sports and energy drinks. You, the, the best prime city in the world to sell uh, sports and energy drinks, it's not Manhattan, it's not Houston or Dallas or Sao Paulo, it's Chongqing. Um, if you want facial moisturizers after Tokyo, it's Shanghai, Beijing, Chongqing. Look at, look at all the, you know, you, if, so if you want to be a relevant player globally in these areas, you better be in these cities uh, that are here. Spirits, I don't know if that's, I don't know when this was done actually before the anti-corruption drive, so it may have changed a bit, <laughs> maybe may a little lower now, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's still a pretty good base to, to work from uh, on it. Um, we, we think over time we're going to see, you know, a shift, it, you know, there, a lot of the income was spent on food in 2005, you know, it, it, that's going to become a much smaller uh, proportion, though the type of food will shift, it'll move towards meats and dairy. Um, uh, healthcare is obviously a, fun, a, a very important uh, area for change that we're going to see, and, and, and transportation, communication, a lot on recreation and education. You know, there'll be 400 million tourist trips per year coming from China. And this is where I think the rest of the world, whether you want to participate in China domestically, doesn't matter so much. You're going to participate with it externally. So again, I come from the west, a small farm town on the west coast of Canada. British Columbia is going to, ha you know, right now, if I get fired from McKinsey, one of the things I would do is set up a big tourism business in British Columbia. It's going to be huge. You're just going to have a massive number of people coming through that want to travel and see a different part of the world. There's many, many opportunities for countries to participate in this growth outside of China because Chinese consumers are globalizing and in travel, but also in terms of where they purchase and, and, and what they do. So I think it's important to look at where the changes are going. The, the other part, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to it, is that the behaviors of these consumers is changing very rapidly, even on an annual basis. We, in McKinsey, for example, when we were serving our multinational clients, we decided we had to build our own database of Chinese consumers because we couldn't rely on the conventional uh, metrics and systems that were out there. So we built our own database of about 3,500 consumers, and that involved things like photographing what was in the fridge, right? Photographing, what, or if they didn't have a fridge, what was in the cold box, right, to, to see. And, and it was amazing to see how quickly Again, that was changing even on an annual uh, basis. So it's a very dynamic group. This is going to put a huge amount of pressure on resources, uh, the, this middle class, the 2.2 billion globally, but also in China. Water, energy, and food are going to be big issues to, for us to deal with. Ag food is, I think, going to be one of the most significant business opportunities in the world. It looks a lot like mining uh, did 30 years ago. It's a very fragmented industry that's going to, I think, consolidate. You're going to see a lot more technology. And that's, again, because uh, those, those workers moving from the rural areas to the urban areas that are increase their salaries and their lifestyle are going to want to eat very differently. And so food is going to be a very big issue. One of the things we have to be careful of is what happens to food inflation in China. One, one of the 
a mentor of mine. It was actually in Kaifeng. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. A, a sort of the old, I guess, the old capital in China at, at, at one point. So to me, it looked like Kansas City. Um, and I remember meeting with the mayor, and we were doing some work right after the financial crisis, where the government put in a stimulus program, which I've never seen anything like. It was a very, it was very precision based. And McKinsey's job was we had a very minor, specific job, which was you need to tell us in tier three and tier four cities, is it better to cut the price of a television by 25% or keep the price the same and then have the consumer go to the mayor's office and get a 25% rebate, which will sell more TVs. That was the kind of the specificity. And I was trying everything I could. McKinsey, I said, McKinsey, you know, we like to work on the big picture. You got to tell us. And they said, none of your business. You just sort out how many TVs can be sold. So I <laughs> kept trying all these different things. And we found out, by the way, the answer was it's better to keep the price the same and get a rebate, that people felt better and they would buy more. And so I, I went back and I said, We've now surely I can see how this fits in the broader program. And I'll never forget the mayor telling me, he says, if you've read your Chinese history, and I don't think you have, um, you'll realize that many of the disruptions occur when there is a food problem. Because when people are hungry, you know, they don't care about security and where things are. It's an issue. So that's what we really focus on, too, is food security. And I think we need to, in the world, need to understand that that's an important part of what China needs as we look around and you see a lot of Chinese companies buying. And it's just a dynamic I think we need to know because as you urbanize a place so quickly and you don't have an agricultural system that is advanced as it will be, that's going to be a challenge. Water is another issue, as you know. We, we, there's, a lot, there's a lot of water shortages. Uh, those are going to have to be uh, sorted out. So it, this, this transition that's happening so quickly, we, again, this is... This transition that we're seeing in the next 20 years is going at about 1,000 times faster and more significantly than the Industrial Revolution, right? So when we think about volatility, let's not be too hard on political leaders in these places because we've never dealt with the scale of things. It, we're going to have some big challenges to deal with, and we're seeing tensions. I think we're going to see more tensions between Vietnam and China on water. A lot of Vietnam's water flows through China first. So if China dams it or uses it for agricultural production, you're going to get tension, just like we're going to see between Ethiopia and Egypt, right? These, this is where we're going to start to, and we just need to know that. It's, to, it's, a, it's a reality uh, as, we, as we look ahead. China is, in this regard, now investing more uh, than, than anyone else in renewables. I mean, the, the, the focus on green, even though the cities may not be playing that role or seeing it as we read the news and we see it in, in Beijing and even Shanghai and other areas, the, the commitment in terms of the resource side is there. I think more needs to be done uh, on that side to be able to make uh, these cities uh, sustainable. And that's, again, why I'm not surprised that you don't see, you see today, I think it's, again, the, I was mentioning this before we came in, the Shanghai mayor is now, again, not got GDP growth is one of his KPIs. It's much more around the, the greening uh, and, and environmental side of how the city is. I'm going to switch to the internet. Is this speed okay, by the way, or do you want me to? So let's go to the internet, which is a third force, which we think is going to really, uh, I think, play a big role in, in transforming the economic system. I think we should recognize that China, again, already has twice as many internet users as the US, just an absolute size, and, and it's got a long way to go. But that's just something to put in perspective, because uh, most people think that um, you know, it's all in the Silicon Valley or in Tel Aviv and other places. It's happening in, in China. Um, at the end of 2012, the e-commerce sales, absolute e-commerce sales in China were bigger than they were in the US. We did a McKinsey prediction. It was actually when I was in Shanghai. This was in 2007. We thought it would happen in 2020. So we were eight years off. Just the speed with which this change occurs is there. And, and if you talk to you know the Facebook, Google, Apple, they will tell you that China was the first to go to mobile commerce. Right In the US, it was very much still PC-based. One of the reasons, for example, Facebook had a lot of difficulty through their IPO. They IPO'd at a very high rate. It then plummeted while they were going through it and then came back as they had to convert from a PC base to a mobile commerce base. And guess where they were doing their learning for that as they, 
they went through it. It was in, in, in China. So again, I'm just making the point, there's a lot we can learn. There's a lot of China that isn't linked up, that needs to be linked up, but it's a pretty significant uh, part of it. We, th I did this chart before we had the fourth quarter uh, results yesterday, and we didn't have time to update it, but it's, you know, you, if you are a global uh, internet player, um, you, you know, you need to think about China as an as a important market uh, to, be, um, to be in. And again, when we think about the internet companies that are there, there are, there are a lot of Chinese uh, internet players uh, that, that rival uh, the, the big three, if you will, that we're seeing in the Silicon Valley. It is a very robust, dynamic uh, market for on, in terms of startups in, in what we're seeing. And that's again why you know, we opened up a Shenzhen office. The main reason we did it is because of the, the internet players that were there and the big data changes that were going on and the talent, that the, the quality of the talent globally that we can access from being in Shenzhen is an important part of, uh, of what, what we need to, to do. And I think it's affecting business models in fundamental ways. Um, you know, uh, John Chambers last week in, in Davos mentioned, you know, how technology is moving at such a fast speed. We're all being affected by it. In his view, he said 40% of companies will not survive the changes that are coming on in the, in the system. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of those, that business model innovation occurring now in China today, and you see it in consumer electronics. I mean, the Xiaomi, which is the, the smartphones that have really hammered Samsung, what, what I think is most interesting about that is not the scale and the speed with which they've come to market, it's how they actually manufacture. They, they manufacture in ways that you do not learn in Harvard Business School. They, they have their own model, that, or ways that McKinsey and company would say you do it. They, they develop their own way of manufacturing and sourcing ideas, very unconventional approach, which has grown a very large business. So it's, it's, it's not the technology, it's how people have adjusted the business model uh, to be able to make, make things work. Uh, finance is a new one. I, I, remember, I remember being in Singapore and the Economic Development Board in Singapore as an advisory group. There's 10 people. Uh, Andrew Witte from Glaxo is on it. Uh, uh, Jack Ma is on it. Um, I'm on it, and, and Jack Ma was describing what Alibaba was doing in financial services, and we were shocked. We actually didn't believe him at first. He said, you know, we've, we now make loans of between $10 to $10,000 to our customers. And people are going, what, what in the hell are you doing going into banking? And he said that, and, he, and the reason we're able to do that is because we have more data than banks do on how people behave. And, you know, I know how much shampoo Peter uses. I know where his kids are. He doesn't use much, by the way. So sort of thing. Sort of, I'm teasing you. Yeah. And he, but I, the most important thing is, I know how uh, if he doesn't pay me back, what I can do is just put a message up on the site saying, you know, Peter's a bad risk. Don't deal with him. And that's not something that he'd want to do uh, in the system. So the power, if you will, is higher. So they have more leverage, more data. Uh, and so, they, they, you know, at the time he was speaking to us, this was two years ago, he had a $16 billion loan portfolio with a fraction of the number of loan officers that a bank would have. And again, we, we were just shocked at, at sort of, of, of where that was. When he started to take effectively deposits, that's when the regulators started to say, whoa, we have to be careful here because now you're getting into the mm. money supply and the banking mm. system. But again, the speed of which this is ha it was happening is something we need to uh, need to need to look at. Um, automotive, a lot of the interesting innovations and in what you can do in terms of monitoring the performance of a car and what insurance companies do with that data is being done uh, in in China. And healthcare is another one where I think we're going to see some radical innovations that are that are going on. And I think that's a combination of the technology, actually some bold public servants. I remember being in a meeting with the Minister of Health in China, with the, the um, head of the Duke Health Center, Victor Zhao, and the head of the GSM network. And the Minister of Health in China was asking Victor Zhao, why does it take seven years to make a doctor? Just why? And, and Victor Zhao was gonna like, you know, want to meet, like, why would you ask that? Of course it takes seven years. I mean, that's how it's, and he said, well, would you like to be operated on in heart surgery, someone has seven years or one year, and the Minister of Health said, well, 
it depends. I'd rather, to me, with all due respect to you, it's mechanics. And if someone's done 10,000 operations on that side, I'd rather pick them than someone else. So th it was a challenge to orthodoxies, right? I'm not, and you get that with technology, and you can do a lot. And, and we're seeing that happening, where we get radically different cost structures to deliver performance at higher levels than we see in, in the West. And we're going to see more of that. So there's a lot of business model change that's going to be occurring in China. And I think, as you said at the outset, one of the challenges is it's happening. We don't even we don't know about it. Well, one of the reasons I love being involved at Tsinghua University, we have a sort of McKinsey lecture series, is actually to meet the graduates from the EMBA program. Because all these people have private companies, right? And I, you just, I'm just amazed at the scale of what they do and where, where they are. But we don't hear about them because they're private, right? And, and, and then you see some of the, the innovations that are going on. So you've got to get into the system uh, beyond the ones that are, are publicly uh, Knowledge. Again, while China has a, the largest base in the world, there's obviously the penetration rates much less than we're seeing uh, in the U.S. There's a lot more to go. But I, I guess I'd just say here the, the power of the internet, I think, to modernize to the Chinese economy cannot be underestimated. Um, and I think also to enable business model changes which will affect organizations in different parts of the world cannot be uh, underestimated. I think the challenge is going to be how much the comfortable the government's going to be with the power that some of the internet players have in terms of the data, uh, in terms of the customer base and the loyalty uh, that they have. That's going to be an interesting dynamic um, as, as, as time evolves uh, in, uh, in this process. We mentioned the, the global champions. Uh, in 2000 and, uh, Seven, uh, there were 53 Asian companies in the Fortune 500. 24 were from China. Uh, in 2014, there's now 94. And these, again, are the publicly listed ones, the ones that we know about. It's not the ones that are uh, relatively small. When I say small, you know, three, four billion dollars in sales that are not yet public, growing at 30 to 40 percent uh, a year. Um, we think between 2010 and 2025, a half of the world's new billion dollar plus companies will be headquartered in China, kind of like a German middle stand. So again, that, you know, the importance of being able to know who these companies are, help them as they go global, as they think about their supply chains, as their customer bases and so forth is going to be uh, very, very important. And th that doesn't mean they're all going to be successful. We're going to see unsuccessful Chinese companies, just like we're seeing in other markets. But that, that, that's a pretty big number to be thinking about half of the billion dollar plus companies in the world being based in China. I mean, that, that concentration level is quite staggering uh, when, when we think about it. Um, the amount of investment that's going on in China, I think, is also uh, interesting. I think if you look at the number of Chinese college graduates, uh, just a you know, seven and a half million. Uh, my obviously a worry here is a lot of them are having difficulty finding jobs. But my my worry with this too is I think there's been too much of a focus on university education and not enough on on vocational. You know, there's a, there's big shortages of workers and machinists, uh, for example, welders, uh, nurse nurses and nurses assistants, jobs that actually pay well but are not filled. And then we have a lot of of unemployed uh, graduates, and so we're going to need to make some changes. But you know what? 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 I think we should also recognize is the change in performance at the elementary school level, and we've seen it with the PISA scores, right? And in, in what's happening there, and then R and D spending as a share of world total, so 17 and a half percent of R and D spending coming from China. And uh, again, that's not necessarily on the leading edge in terms of you know, advanced materials and so forth. But if you start investing and spending that much money over time, you eventually uh, get to the stage where you begin to be on the, on, the, on the leading edge. And I think, again, in the United States, we forget, we don't appreciate enough how much government spending, public government investment has done to create innovation in the United States. DARPA has been a massive 
driver of innovation in the US. It's not just being the crazy, brilliant innovators in Stanford and so forth doing these things. There's been a lot of government money behind that, and we're seeing that uh, in China, and we're seeing that also with companies. One thing I'd mention, we've done benchmarking of Chinese multinationals with their Western peers. So you look at a consumer goods company, and you look at an automotive company, and you, you look at a, a company that's making you know, railroad tracks. And what we found is that, on average, the Chinese company invests at double the rate that the Western player does. So they're investing at double the rate. They have much less dividend flow. They're just reinvesting it back in the company, right? So they're, they're investing for the long term. And the other ironic thing is when we've looked at them in competing markets, let's say in a place like India or Nigeria or Brazil, the Chinese companies on average make decisions at twice the speed that the Western player. They, they're, they're more uh, disaggregated. Now I'm generalizing, there's always an exception, but we, we found that that, 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 that that general rule held irrespective of the sector. It was the Chinese versus the, and, and that's again I think something about the prospects of these companies and playing global roles. There's lots of challenges and we've talked about in the course, I think, if I might say, I think Ch China has a tin ear, it's an English expression, it's just completely unaware of some of the cultural or the political dynamics that go on in countries. So, you know, you when you, if I remember the Nexon deal that was done, for example, in, in, in Canada, you, you know, it's very important to understand the, what the mayor thinks and what the local newspapers think and what the labor union thinks and biases. People saying, are we gonna fire all the people? Or, so there's a lot of, that. that's typically ignored. That's been the case in Africa. And it's not because I think the Chinese companies don't care, they're just completely not aware of it. So it's how do you build that capability of soft power, if you will, to be able to influence uh, what's happening. This happened, by the way, with Korean companies. I remember when Doosan, which is a company that makes backhoes and actually nuclear plants, a whole range of things, bought um, Bobcat, which was a North Dakota-based company. And I, I could have made a movie out of this one because to see the cultural clash was unbelievable. And, and the CEO of Doosan talks about it. So you have this Korean company coming into Fargo, right, North Dakota. Mm. The workers think these guys are gonna take over the company and fire everyone, even though they're actually, Doosan wanted to use this as a base to grow their global business. The politicians are all worried. The sen no, one, no, no one from Doosan talked to the senator who was there about what was going on. And then just in the building, what the Doosan guys, the Korean, colleagues were surprised about is a lot of the pe workers from Fargo, you know, they, were, they came in at seven in the morning and they left at five because they often were, they were farming. They had farms, right, dairy farms, which they, the Korean guys just couldn't believe that someone, A, comes in that early and then goes farming afterwards. And then the, 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 the Fargo citizens were sitting there looking at these North Koreans coming in at nine in the morning and then literally at sort of if, you, if they turn their lights on at two in the morning, the lights would still be on. These guys are crazy, they just work. That's all they did was work and drink at the time. And so you had this cultural clash and it was not, no one did anything wrong, it was just no time spent on that. And I think we're gonna see that with, you know, again, you know, as, as more Chinese companies go abroad, there's the cultural side. With the soft side is probably the hardest part as we, as we go through it. The technology, the business processes are not there. And again, I look at Lenovo, you know, the CEO of Lenovo is totally comfortable being at the Wall Street Journal CEO conference. He's, he's more swimming in that water than anyone else. He doesn't look, but again, they've had seven years of working in different parts of the world with different people, but it's gonna take time as, as they go through this. Um, I mentioned before uh, the vocational need. One of the things with, the, with the, the, a, a, an aging population in China, which will be an issue, is we're actually gonna have shortages of workers, particularly again on the vocational and university level. Unfortunately, we're gonna have excess supply in the untrained workers, and that's where we're gonna to have to think about tensions and inequality and so forth. But in the skilled areas, middle-skilled, high-skilled, we're gonna have by 2020 some pretty significant uh, shortages in the order of 24 million people. And that will cause issues on wages, it's gonna cause issues on reliability, um, of, of where you do your manufacturing. Um, 
these are, this is where we think the biggest demand is going to be uh, over time. I'm not for the again sake of time. I'm not going to go through all of them, but health and social services are going to be a very important part of uh, this growth. Um, and again, as I said, we've seen as China's modernized, we're seeing a, a shift from the. It's no way is it a is it a, a sort of the low cost factory anymore. That's that's been gone a long time ago. It's definitely moving up. Uh, the value chain in, in where it is, and that's again where education is going to play a much more important role. And I'd actually argue educational relationships with other countries uh, in in what's happening. We're going to have to see much more of that uh, happening. State influence is the fifth one I wanted to talk about. Uh, obviously, the corruption issue is a is a big one. My own sense, and there's others here who are, who are actually living in China, but I've definitely noticed there's just a little more. Uh, uncertainty and fear uh, in in the system. You don't want the whatever it's called the investigative unit showing up in your city um, because you know, or you don't want to have a cup of tea with Wang Shishang. I don't think that's a <laughs> invitation you really want to get uh, at any uh, point. Um, I do think that there's been uh, more aggressiveness on antitrust. I think uh, some of it very much warranted because there've been some practices that were not. Right, but but you do have to recognize that there are an increasing number of foreign executives who are feeling like they're less, less welcome. Whether it's the truth or not in terms of what's happening, that's how they feel, and that's something we have to look at. I've never heard that directly from any senior government official. I've never heard that. There's always a welcome map, but I think there's the subtle sides of, of doing that, that it, that's an issue that people um, have to have, have to deal with. We, we had our own issue in McKinsey, I think it was the FT that put out that said, you know, McKinsey, Accenture, IBM, you know, they, we, we're going to be careful about them working with SOEs because we're sort of American companies. And what, again, we couldn't find anyone who actually said it, uh, but it did make people nervous, right? And, and we never stopped the work we were doing with SOEs, but work we were about to start, people were nervous about it and saying, well, we better check this out. We're not, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's there. So this is, but again, that doesn't mean we should run away from this. I think this is natural volatility in what you go through and you have to kind of see through it and work your way uh, uh, through it. Um, I think some of the changes going on uh, that the, the, the um, national governments putting in place with local governments about privatizing their holdings. I mean, a large chunk of the economy is still owned at the local level by local governments. And this privatization, if you will, and changing the model of financing from selling real estate to more having a, a municipal bond market, I think is going to make things a lot better. That transition is difficult to do. It's easy if you are small, but these cities are like countries. To, so to transform a city that's been used to being able to access property market sales to be able to fuel their growth. And so you're going to go to a, a, a bond to collect taxes and now have a, 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 a bond market is not going to be a straightforward thing. But I think the direction of travel is very clear in what has to happen here. And then on the financial market, um, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is the growth of the shadow banking system. And this is something that the you know, government is all over. They know this is something that has to be dealt with. They're putting in measures to try and restrict that. But the um, the shadow banking system is an, an issue. And the reason we worry about an issue issue here is when it's in shadow means it's uncontrollable, and that's where you can get volatility. You can get a lot of hurt being done to consumers. They work with institutions that are not really that viable or regulated properly. So changing that's going to be important. And I think the one of the most important things is China has to move quickly from a very bank-dominated financial system to more of a capital markets-based system. And I think, again, we've seen some big steps to try and move the economy that way. And we shouldn't forget, by the way, you look at Korea, look at Singapore, look at Japan, even 30 to 40 years ago were very bank-dominated systems that have actually changed. I remember being based out of Korea, helping the Singaporean government develop a bond market. There was not a government bond market in Singapore at the time, which you, you, it's hard to imagine that today. Singapore is a financial center, but they made the changes they needed to, and I think that's what's going to be happening uh, here. The Shanghai-Hong Kong financial linkage, I think, is going to allow, it's a pipe, if you will, to allow uh, much more 
openness and capital moving. I don't think I'd be interested in people's views. I, I don't think the flows have been as big as people expected. They were at the beginning, uh, but they haven't sustained themselves, right? And I think part of that's because the Shanghai market is very retail dominated. It's, I'm not sure about the fundamental, you don't see a lot of Warren Buffetts in, in that system, right? And it, over time you will get, I think, more of a long-term you know, value creation approach in it as opposed to a retail, almost casino-like approach, which we've seen in other markets, that's what the, the Seoul market had, had, uh, had been like. I'm gonna skip uh, through that, as I'm, I think I'm talking for too long here. Um, so again, these are the, the forces that I've mentioned that we think are gonna be shaping it, uh, shaping this country, shaping the businesses, shaping all of us in the world. And again, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very bullish on it. I think the only thing I just have two last charts and then I'll shut up here. I think one is, um, as we look at 2015, this is actually from my colleague Gordon Orr, who's been living in China for about 25 years. He's the one, I don't know whether he was drinking too much alcohol or what, predicted one of the big buildings would burn uh, when that CCTV building, and so people follow his blog. I actually believe he's got some substance to him. But one of the things he, one he thing he worries about, I just say, is the you know, we're, we're gonna have our lowest annual income growth in China for a decade. This is again, many consumers are used to this very high level of growth. So it's not what the rest of the world thinks, it's what the consumer thinks. And what they haven't experienced, certainly a recession, but also a decrease. And so the question is, what's that gonna do to uh, uh, consumption? A sense that they're feeling a little bit less financially secure. Again, we would we would beg to have the kind of domestic kind of situation that's going on here in any developed market, certainly in Europe, but it's the rate of change and it's definitely dropped a bit for China. So what does that mean? Um, we're seeing much more of the students uh, heading now towards the private sector for job creation. That's been a, a shift. Uh, we think on the Hong Kong, Shanghai thing, one of the more interesting things is the flows actually going into Hong Kong may also be um, a, quite, quite a good thing to, ha to happen. And then we're seeing these city transformation programs now where cities are looking at fundamentally how do we actually operate in a, in a totally different way using our water, um, using our energy, uh, thinking about our transportation and uh, data. We're gonna see much more impact on innovation in the world from the Chinese players, but, and it's the mid-size Chinese companies that are leading the way. And this business system disruption innovation is that that's where I would be spending time is trying to understand what's happening in whatever business I'm in because there's very interesting things going on and I think the the rule of law I think is gonna is is impacting everyone I think in a good way I mean a lot one of the biggest pushes and I, I defer to our colleagues here uh, on this but on internet in, intellectual property I think one of the biggest drivers of that has been Chinese companies suing each other as opposed much as the other way around on that and that's where you're getting the the activity that's going on. Um, the, we worry a bit about some cities that are too dependent on single industries, um, you know, in Inner Mongolia and coal mining, um, auto making or, or textiles. The diverse, diversification of the economies is gonna be a important part of, of what happens. And then again, final page, uh, truly will shut up. I think again, uh, e-commerce, is, is a, it's, it's a massive market. The platforms that these internet companies have now put in place, I think provide huge opportunities for not only small, medium-sized players in China, but also global players to be able to participate in a very large market. Um, ag food is gonna be a humongous uh, global business, which a lot of organizations don't, uh, I think, underappreciate. Education. Uh, is going to be a very, very large business, uh, driven again, I think, a lot by China. Healthcare, another huge business uh, opportunity, innovation. Logistics, already some of the most significant logistics players in the world are based in China, again, because of all the e-commerce uh, activity. And then uh, on IT services, we think there's gonna be a lot of changes. So these are just some of the areas we see as change. Again, forgive me, I've blathered for too long, but I hope that's just given a bit of a picture. Again, in a nutshell, I feel very bullish, but I would just be prepared for volatility. And I think, again, you know, if, if you don't like volatility, then you should just 
bury yourself in a hole and hope it all ends. So you got to deal. That's the reality of what we deal with. Volatility is there, and so address it. And I think this market itself is going to be exciting, and these companies and organizations coming out of China are going to be very exciting for the world. Thank you. Dominic, thank you very, very much yeah. indeed. Thank you. Yeah. We've got time for a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, uh, Dominic, thank you very much indeed. Dominic yeah. has a very uh, tight schedule running from one meeting to the other, but he's got time to take a few questions. Yeah. So, sure. do you want to okay. take yeah. questions? Go ahead. Relating to your point about cities and mayors and perhaps the way things used to be done, uh, relating to your point about cities and mayors and the way things used to be done, um, there's still in many non internet sectors, you know, every city has its car or bus company or at least province or its desal membrane company. How does that inefficiency and consolidation play out, as you described, with privatization and, and cities learning a different way to do things? Well, I think that there's the need overall for consolidation in China is quite high. I think there's something like 939 pharma companies. I probably don't have their number, but it's that order of magnitude. By the way, one of the best sources of information on the industry structure of China are the big banks, right? If you talk to ICBC has a very good picture of, of what, it, what that looks like. And I think one of the things we're going to have to see is consolidation. The challenge is, as you said, it's almost then like having city-states because those, those companies create jobs. And so I think the need for workouts uh, is going to be an important part of, of, uh, of what happens. But again, when we think about some of the KPIs, the, many of these businesses, I think we had one of the slides, 97,000 businesses are actually not, they're not making money at all. And I think by shutting them down and reallocating those resources to other places, that's what needs to be done. The challenge is when you do that, there's losers and, and winners. And that's why I think the, what, we need to do, what, what we need to have is role model cities that are trying to do it. Shanghai is actually trying uh, to, to do this and make in sort of rationalizing some sectors, trying to grow other sectors and trying to think about a safety net for the people that are affected um, uh, in, the, in the training. So I think it can, if anyone can do it in a way, I think China can because there's a kind of a determination that, that it, it be done that way. And, and I think with the anti-corruption, that, that could help. What I, worry, what I worry more about is some of the, you know, there may be trade bar soft trade barriers forming between provinces. We've seen that with some of our clients just because you know, if a good has to go from one province to the next, all of a sudden it becomes a bit like Uganda and Kenya. There's 17 checks that are being done on the truck just because we want to really check that the quality of that pork is, you know, right. And it's non-tariff barriers that are happening. So that's something that I think the government's going to have to be very wary about as you consolidate. Uh, thanks very much for your insights about um, Chinese companies. My question was about uh, UK companies or uh, Western companies and how if they're going into China, where you see the challenges facing them uh, and uh, sort of what they can do uh, to enter the Chinese market as well as all the things you've identified um, and what a government could be doing to help uh, UK companies uh, take advantage of all of the uh, amazing opportunities you just talked about. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I, I would sort of say, even though China's this massive market, I, one term I'd use is granularity, right? It's the, again, the clusters. I'd be thinking very, I don't think about China as one, which is the one place you want to start? And I think you can actually do analysis before you even get there as to where those opportunities are. I showed you at a, a superficial level which, you know, cities would matter most to you. And you can actually get that data is available. Um, so I think being very selective about where you go in is one thing. And you actually, there is, you can get that information from here. You don't have to be in China to get that, right? At least an initial view. I think the second thing is you, you know, if you're, if you're serious, this is where I think the government uh, can play a role, is government, I think, can play a much bigger role in also providing a mapping for people. Because a lot of, especially if you're an SME in in the UK, you don't have the resources to be able to fly over there and, and do this. But I think the government can do a even more effective job of map providing that mapping for people and say, this is a place where you actually could provide it. The Germans do this very well. Uh, 
The Germans, just to give you an example, A, provide the mapping for people. B, when they do their big trips, like with Angela Merkel when she comes over, it typically is with the, the docks group of companies come over and they bring their suppliers with them. So Siemens comes with 35 of their suppliers and Siemens plays a role in helping those suppliers get contracts with the people. So they actually, like a big brother role, if you will, to help them move it. I don't see that happening in the UK. I don't, I don't see big UK companies going over and bring, and we've got some really innovative companies here uh, that are there. So I, I think that's another dimension. The third is actually with investors. There are now an increasing group of Chinese investors that will take a percentage of the company and then for that, want to take that company into the market. One individual who does that is Victor Chu, who's Far Eastern. He's Hong Kong based, mm -hmm. London based. What he does is invest in Western, small Western companies. He just set up a fund, a $50 million fund in Nova Scotia, the eastern part of mm -hmm. Canada, for companies to be able to, now they get access to his network mm -hmm. to go in to China. They don't lose control. They're still owned by those Halifax entrepreneurs, but they're, he owns a percent. They get in. So I think there's ways of using capital uh, to move it. And, and the fourth thing is I would be much, much more embracing of the invest, institutional investors in China. I, you know, CIC, that there's a lot of very important investors in China that I think would, it's also good. They're long-term investors. And think about spending time with them about attracting them to be able to invest and, and do things over time. So those are just some of the dimensions, I think. I think there's a, it's way underpenetrated. There's a lot of things that, that in all those sectors I mentioned, automotive, healthcare, education, I, I just tick, tick, tick. That This country can do so much on that side. Um, and it's not just the big ones, it's, it's the small ones that are. Um, my name is Alex Zhao, I'm from EY, and I just have a quick question regarding to the innovation. You mentioned about that uh, Shenzhen and Hangzhou are the place to look at other than Silicon Valley on big data. Do you see any other sort of innovation come out from those two cities and why those particular those two cities are doing better than Silicon Valley? Well, I think Sh Shenzhen is actually, it just happens to be where some of the big entrepreneurs are, right? Where they grew up. You've got some very good universities there. Um, you've got... I think it's a collaboration now between Xinhua and Cal State, which is in Shenzhen. I may have the U.S. University wrong, but doing actually big data degrees, if you will. That's, that's, so you've got U.S. students wanting to do the degree there as well as the um, local players. So you've got an education hub. You've got entrepreneurs in Hangzhou. You've, that's where um, Jack Ma is from. You actually have a lot of the, um, the uh, Indian IT players are there. It's a one place in, where you can get very good Indian food in Hangzhou. It's one of the best places. We used to have a big group. So it's, it's a talent pool that's actually being formed. Yeah. Chongqing, I think, is, is actually a leader in, in innovation on how cities work, and they have to. But you've had a, very, a series of very aggressive uh, leaders in that city to attract foreign direct investment uh, to move in. You've got a lot of global companies that have based their manufacturing, UTC, the big uh, US uh, advanced industries conglomerate doing things there, DuPont, Dow. Uh, and so they built a system, you've got an education system, and then you've got, again, a leadership that right now is very worried about environmental issues and very open for people bringing ideas, how, how to do uh, mixed income housing. Uh, to do that appropriately. What, how can we use technology on our road system better and attracting Japanese companies, uh, Hitachi and others, to come in? So those are, you know, again, I think innovations that we're, uh, we're seeing um, in, in it. Uh, 
Thank you, Dominic. I'm Julie from Phoenix New Media. My question is, uh, have you noticed that uh, the Hong Kong businessman Lee Ka Shing's investment in the UK tend to be the top one uh, foreign investor in the UK? Uh, some people said he is uh, not un a few unsecure in China's market, or uh, he's more optimistic in the UK's market. What do you think? Thank you. I, well, I don't pretend to know Li Ka Xing personally, so I'm not going to speak on behalf of him. But I, the way I interpret it is, I think it's a, he's a global businessman. Um, he, he also owns a big oil company and he owns Husky Oil. He owned a bank. You know, he's a global. I think he looks where oppor He's a trader. He looks where the opportunities are, and I think there are quite a lot of Chinese investors that are actually quite optimistic about Europe more than, frankly, the Europeans. It's quite, it's quite interesting, you know what I mean? Maybe because they're long term. I don't, you know, and it's a, so you're seeing, I've seen it in Spain, I've seen it in Italy, uh, obviously in the UK. I think it's as much to do, in my view, as the opportunity in the UK. The U UK is a, uh, an attractive economy, it's growing, it's, a, it's growing well. Uh, the the tech telecom sector is going through um, transition. So I think there's, you know, why did Carlos Slim invest in a Dutch telecom company. You know, when a lot of people said, are you crazy? I mean, have you seen what's actually going? He says, well, I'm, I'm, I have a long-term view of, uh, of Europe. So I don't think it's about my own view. I don't think this is a statement about China. I think it's a global business person who's looking for opportunities. He's one of the biggest reallocators of capital. You, he swings. When he decides he's going to shift, he does it dramatically when the portfolio, I think it's just the latest. Maybe it's, I'd say it's more of a message of he's an older guy, but he's young at Heart, maybe he's sort of showing, I'm still here, I'm doing some big things. That, that would be my view. Uh, my question is about the demographic issues. Which demographic issue? Demo so, demographic? Yep. Yeah. So, what is the impact of the aging society to the China's long term growth prospects? And uh, what are your suggestions to the Chinese government on managing this uh, demographic transition? Thank you. Yeah. It's a, gr it's a great question. I probably should have spent more time on it because I think it's one of the headwinds that's coming. There's a lot of tailwinds, urbanization and so forth, but it's a, it's a headwind because it's coming quite quickly. I think 2020 is when we're going to really start to, to see it occur. And I, I would have, that's still time. It's not next year, but it's, there's still time. And I think there's a China speed, so I'm confident we can figure out how to do it. But I, a couple of things I'd focus on. One is pension reform. I think it's very important that there be pension reform in China to ensure that that aging population is going to be able to have the savings and the security. Because one of the reasons I think, by the way, that China is at 40% domestic consumption versus 75, not only because of the level of wages, the savings rates are so high, as you know. And that's not, I don't believe the kind of, you will Chinese, it's a confusion, Confucian thing that, Chinese people save more. I, I don't buy that. I, I think what it is is if you don't have health care insurance mm -hmm. and a pension, you better save money. Because if someone gets sick, how are they going to be taken care of? I think it's a very rational view. So we need to get that going. I think there's some really good examples. The Australian example, I know the, the former Prime Minister Paul Keating has spent time in China. I, I, if you look at what Australia has done in their pension reform, it's, it's amazing. Australia is the fourth largest asset management market in the world mm -hmm. for a country of 30 million people because of brilliant pension reform. And that's what I think if China can take a leaf out of that book and put it in place. So pension reform is very important, how, to, how we move that forward. Or we're going to really hit a problem um, in, in the 20, because it, it'll get worse and worse. We have time right now as we've got Lots of good growth and, and savings. Uh, the second is technology. Um, you know, w one of the biggest downsides of an aging population is you have less people going into the labor force. And I mentioned we're going to have a 24 million person skill gap. In the last 50 years in the world, half of our global GDP growth came from more labor going into the labor market. That's where the productivity came from, right? It wasn't just better technology. It was we had a younger population and we had women going into the workforce. So we're going to have this headwind. And what I think is going to be very important is we're going to have to have, in the pension reform, people working longer in China. The idea of a pension age being 65 is a joke. 
it's just not. I think I think it, someone can tell me in the UK when it was put in place. I think it was six. I, I can't remember the exact number, but I think when it was eight, it was eight eight years to live. Is that right? I mean, that, you just now we're obviously way beyond that. It wasn't a very luxurious program. Let me put it that way. We just look, so we got to reform that. But I think we've also got to think about technology, and this is where I think technology is coming in. Automation, um, automation, is actually helping fewer laborers be more effective. The challenge with automation is who gets the surplus? Is it the laborer or the technology owner? That's that's the only challenge we're going to have to work through in that. But I, but I, I actually think technology is going to be a very important part of uh, closing the gap with fewer workers. And we've seen it, you know, with what Foxconn has been doing with robots. Um, you know, we're going to see it, I think, in many other mm. areas, healthcare, um, a lot, a lot with the using data and, and, and electronic delivery systems. So I think it's around pension reform and I, and, and on technology, which are going to be very important, uh, ways of being able to move it. You could argue immigration, but I, I think the numbers are so big. I, I, and I don't know who you'd get the immigration from. For Japan, it's relatively more straightforward, though you have cultural issues, I, I, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. Maybe the last question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you refer to Chinese local governments and the, their dis distressed balance sheets. Uh, are you referring to uh, the aggregate balance sheet of the state-owned enterprises linked to the government, or are you referring to something else? Um, and uh, um, as part of the reforms, there's, uh, there's been introduction of mixed ownership in encouraging privately owned enterprises to um, invest in um, state-owned enterprises. What's your views on that in the, terms of the progress on that subject? And do you see opportunities for the West to tap into that um, that sector where um, state-owned enterprises are being restructured and turned more commercial? Yeah, I, on the first part, I think a lot of the distressed balance sheets are at the city level. I think there's a lot of non-performing loans and because people don't want to reduce the employment on it, they, they don't get restructured, right, because of the, the employment cost that, that's there. And, and they've been subsidized by real estate expenditures, which I think you just, it, you can't keep that moving. And that's one of the challenges, I think, with moving to a, one of, one of the challenges, moving to a municipal bond market, because then analysts will look at it and, and look at the taxes and the inflows and what the underlying performance is, and that's going to force restructuring. So I think the, the challenge is how do we get that, get local governments to actually restructure? Um, that's, to me, the biggest issue. And then on the opportunity for Western companies, I think there's huge opportunities to do it. The challenge right now is the, the uncertainty and so forth. It's, you know, there's, what I see is when you want to do, if you take, there's some very, very large SOEs, as you know, and um, they have many huge businesses just within them. Right? If you think about some of the oil companies, they've got some of you know, the largest oil services company are a small division with, within the company. And um, so, there's no question those are going to have to be broken out. If you're, there are a lot of private equity firms that would love to take a chunk out, r run it as efficiently in a focused way as possible. But how you do the deal is then becomes the issue. And what I would worry about, I'm just saying, if I was an SOE CEO, I'd be very worried about doing a deal where I look like I've given up money I shouldn't have. I may get in trouble. Uh, for that, so that so there's a bit of a hesitation to do deals is what is what I feel. That's just my even though the logic is there, and so I, I actually think over time that it will be, because it will settle down. And maybe it'll take two years. I don't know, but I think it will settle down. And there's no question that these many of these different enterprises have to be um, broken up. You, you just they're too big for any human to run. They're just they're mammoth in, in the scale of, of what they do. And, and given all this disruption that's going on, you know, I think you see a lot of the CEOs that, that, that see that. But it's a tough, I have to say, I feel a bit badly for some of the SOE CEOs. Think about this with the, you know, you talk about Switzerland, the vote about having a cap on C CEO salaries. I think it's now, what is it? One, I think the CEO of an SOE cannot earn more than seven times 
what I think the average is of where it is, where things, a lot of the bank CEOs, and I'm not whining for CEOs and where it is, but when you're not, what, it doesn't give you a lot of motivation to take risk and restructure when, you know, you're, the, the, the comp is there. So I think there's going to have to be some calming down on the uncertainties of the changes that are going on. I, I think the, how people are paid needs to be re-looked at. Uh, in there, that may be, I don't, that's a political issue, but I think it has to be looked at because you're not going to attract a lot of talent uh, to want to go in there. And I still don't think we have, um, in SASEC, I don't think there's a leader, right, in, in there yet, a full, t you know, that, that's in place right now, right after some of the changes. I don't, that's my understanding. Someone can correct me. And that's, I hope that yeah. will, because that, that I think can help too. There was a lot of good initiatives, but it sort of, it just feels like it stalled a bit. That's just my sense. But lots of opportunity. And, and by the way, a lot of, I'm not talking about Western private equity, a lot of Chinese private equity players that are looking at these opportunities to, to mm. you know, build businesses and, and aggregate them. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very, thank very you, much. Thank you, you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do you stay for you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, so I'm Stephen Perry, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, the, um, First thing I should do is to thank uh, Linklaters for providing us with all the support and facilities to have um, such a fine evening at their expense, I guess. Uh, a really fine team. Thank the 48 Group team who put this together. Uh, Dominic, I was, uh, I'm one of the probably few people who watch CCTV9. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I, I'm an unusual sleeper. Anyway, I was watching it one day, and there's a very good program, one very good program, which is Dialogue. Mm. And uh, I happened to watch when you were being interviewed mm. by that very fine uh, presenter. Mm. And uh, he was asking you questions, and you were able to answer them. Mm -hmm. I suddenly sat up and said, here's someone who really knows China. <laughs> I want him to be able to speak to the young icebreakers. Mm -hmm. So I thought, how do I find you? Mm -hmm. I thought, well, the guy who knows everything about China, as you said, is Peter. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm Peter. I said, do you know Dominic? And here we are tonight. And wasn't it worth it? I mean, that was just the, I didn't stop taking notes the whole way through mm -hmm. your presentation. Mm -hmm. I, th I thought uh, any compliment I could mm -hmm. give you mm -hmm. would uh, mm -hmm. sound either patronizing or, well, you know, it was just really very, very fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether you'd let us put your slides up on our mm. on our site, mm. but um, mm. I've taken copious notes, and I won't ask you if I can use them. Sure. <laughs> but it would be wonderful to be able to share mm. uh, your perceptions of China with others. Mm. Uh, you just at the end were talking about the, uh, I think it's, uh, somebody told me, 6,000 private equity companies in China, and the important role they have in the restructuring of uh, state-owned enterprises, and you talked about the consolidation of many industry sectors, and I, I, I suspect private equity in China will probably play a yeah. significant role. And uh, it was good to hear your confirmation. The, the, the different uh, motivation of Chinese companies compared to Western companies, I, I say market share rather than profit, yeah. but yeah. I was just fascinated by your, you know, you've had such experience in China, that perception that we have to understand the drivers of Chinese companies that are different. Um, and, you know, the, the concern about provinces and cities, the emergence of the northern region, uh, and, and regions possibly replacing uh, provinces as the main organ of Chinese um, central government in, in, in the outer areas of China. Overall, um, it was just a fascinating opportunity to tour China with you through your mm. eyes. And uh, there will be um, an appropriate time later this year, a time when we will um, recognize your contribution to us tonight. Uh, but for now, let me say thank you very much indeed. Mm. It was a really great evening. Thank you.